Hello again, anatomy and physiology students. This is the third lecture in the anatomy and physiology course. Today we're going to discuss the structure of individual cells. Uh, this is pretty small scale stuff. It's not really what we discuss in, in what's known as gross anatomy, where we discuss large body parts and so on. But we have to get through it because it's part of the course curriculum. Okay, so let's discuss cells, individual cells. Okay, so the difference, one of the main differences that a biologist in general has to know is the difference between something called a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. Just in general, a prokaryotic cell is a bacteria, bacterium, uh, and a, everything else is a eukaryotic cell. And the main structural difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell is that a prokaryotic cell does not have a nucleus, whereas a eukaryotic cell keeps its genes in a special compartment called the nucleus. Uh, in addition to that, eukaryotic cells tend to be a lot bigger than prokaryotes. Uh, you can also call any animal that, that has cells that have nuclei in them, you can call that animal a, a eukaryote, whereas any bacteria is referred to as a prokaryote. All right, now within, within the cell, if you look at either uh, a prokaryote or a eukaryote, there are little tiny organs inside the cells. Uh, and and uh, as you know, the human body is composed of organs. We have a heart and a liver and kidneys and so on. And plants have organs too, the little tiny organs that carry out specialized functions in the cell. Uh, except that they're so small that we don't call them organs, we call them organelles. We call them organelles. Um, and in generally in prokaryotes, the or, there are only a few organelles and they're very small, whereas in eukaryotes we have much larger organelles that do certain jobs and we'll get into that. Okay, uh, examples of organelles include the nucleus, which I just mentioned, something called the endoplasmic reticulum, things called mitochondria, singular word for that is mitochondrion. Okay, and then we'll tell, we'll, we'll discuss, uh, briefly discuss the difference between a plant cell and an animal cell. Basically, they're very similar, except that plant cells are photosynthetic generally, uh, they, and therefore they have an organelle that is called a chloroplast. So chloroplasts are organelles that are photosynthetic, which allow the plants to generate energy from the sun, from sunlight. Animal cells don't have uh, chloroplasts, both plant and animal cells have mitochondria, but uh, animal cells don't have chloroplasts and that's why we're not photosynthetic, so we can't generate power from the sun. Um, but in addition to that, a plant cell also has a, a rigid structure on the outside of the plant cell called a cell wall. Okay, and then we'll, we'll compare the relative sizes of cells. As I mentioned earlier, the size of a eukaryotic cell is usually much bigger than the size of a prokaryotic cell. And then finally at the end, we, we will look at some of the microscopes that are used, some of the different types of microscopes that are used to look at cells. Uh, a lot of the structures that we're going to study in this course for anatomy are visible with the naked eye, but if we're looking at a smaller level, if we're looking at tissues or something like that at the smaller level and we need to, we need to examine individual cells, we need to use a microscope. So there are several different types of microscopes that biologists typically use and we'll have a brief review of those. All right, so a cell is the smallest unit of life. Uh, if you study anything larger than a cell, you're a biologist. If you study anything smaller than a cell, you're probably call your, calling yourself a biochemist. Okay, now first, going from the outside in, the boundary of the cell, the outer wall of the cell, is referred to as the plasma membrane. And it is made of phospholipids, which we discussed in the last lecture, the lecture on macromolecules. So if you take two layers of phospholipids and you make them face one another so that the, the phosphate groups are on the outside and the lipids are on the inside, then you have a circular structure called a plasma membrane. Okay, so both animal cells and plant cells, as well as bacterial cells, they all have a plasma membrane. That's one thing they all have. In addition to that, plant cells have a cell wall, which is made of a polysaccharide called cellulose. Okay, so don't confuse the plasma membrane with the term cell wall, because cell wall refers specifically to the, to the rigid wall that surrounds a plant cell. But 
both plant cells and animal cells have a plasma membrane. It's just that the plant, in a plant, the plasma membrane is inside the cell wall. Okay, then there's a structure in the middle called the nucleus, which is where the DNA that, that makes the genes is stored, right? So the genes are stored in the nucleus in a eukaryote. The genes are normally um, organized on linear structures, on little rod-shaped structures called chromosomes. Each chromosome is a single thread of DNA, right? So chromosomes. Uh, a genome is a word that's used to describe all the genes that a particular organism is supposed to have. So there's a human genome, and the human genome consists of all the genes that humans are supposed to have. There's a there's a you know there's a bee genome that consists of all the genes that bees are supposed to have, and so on. And the human genome consists of 23,000 different genes. 23,000. Those 23,000 different genes are not all located on the same piece of DNA. They are located on individual pieces of DNA that are called chromosomes. We have, in fact, we have 23 chromosomes. So that means each chromosome contains roughly 1,000 genes on it. So we have around 23,000 genes and we have exactly 23,000 chromosomes, uh, 23 chromosomes. So that means there's approximately 1,000 genes per chromosome. Um, we are what is called diploid, which means that we have two copies of each, two copies of the genome in every cell. Right, so if one of our genes that encodes for a certain protein is mutated, it doesn't really matter that much because we have another one. So we have two. We have a spare one. Uh, some organisms like bacteria and some protozoa are haploid. Haploid means that you have only one copy of the genome. Okay, so bacteria are easily killed if you mutate one of their genes because they don't have a spare. Bacteria are haploid. Okay, so humans are diploid. We have two copies of each chromosome. We have two, co two complete copies of the human genome in every cell. And those genes in the genome are distributed amongst 23, different, uh, 23 independent chromosomes. Okay, so eukaryotes or eukaryotic cells tend to be large and they have a nucleus with linear chromosomes. Prokaryotes tend to be very small. They have no nucleus and they have a circular chromosome. So the, it's the, the chromosome uh, prokaryotes, bacteria, do not have multiple chromosomes the way humans do. Humans have 23 chromosomes and we have two of each. So in, in total, we have 46. Uh, bacteria generally just have one chromosome and instead of being linear like a rod, it's circular like a rubber band. Okay, so the size difference. Commenting on the size difference, these are a type of cell called a buccal cell. And you might have read figure one and you've seen which area I'm talking about when I refer to the buccal area of the body. Okay, so the, a buccal cell, buccal area of the body refers to the cheeks, the, in, the, the cheek area of your face. So there are cells on the inside of your cheeks that are easily torn away if you rub a toothpick inside your cheek or a swab. And then you, if you put that onto a microscope slide, you will see the buccal cells. They're, they're very easy to dislodge. They're very easy to come off. So you can see that these are buccal cells, right? And you can see in the middle here, there's a nucleus. And these little dots are bacteria. So you can see that the, that, that the eukaryotic cells that you get when you scrape the inside of your mouth with a toothpick, they are about a thousand times bigger than bacteria. Okay, so here's a diagram of a cell and you can see the nucleus right there and you can see the plasma membrane on the outside and you can see some of the other organelles like mitochondria and the rough endoplasmic reticulum on the inside. This is a diagram of a bacteria, and remember that these little things down here are the bacteria, so they are much smaller than the eukaryotic cells. And bacteria uh, do not have a nucleus. They have a single uh, chromosome that's, that's uh, round. It's a circular chromosome. And the circular chromosome is usually kind of balled up, as if you took a rubber band and you rolled it between your two hands. Instead of a rubber band, you would have kind of a ball. The, the circular chromosome would, would round up into a kind of a twisted ball and that's exactly what happens to the singular the single circular chromosome that you find inside a bacterium okay so again the scale is quite different you can tell the difference between large eukaryotic cells and small bacterial cells all right so how big are they well eukaryotes in general if you're talking about in the human body the average size is about 10 micrometers 
Okay, so we'll discuss what a micrometer is shortly. But basically, if you take a meter stick and you divide it into 100, you have centimeters, right? So one centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. If you divide a meter into a thousand, you have a millimeter. That's a millimeter. If you divide a meter into a million, then you have a micrometer, which is also called a micron for short. And cell biologists, people who study cells for a living, tend to discuss cells in on the scale of microns. So a typical eukaryotic cell, like the cells that humans are made of, a typical eukaryotic cell is around 10 microns. It has a nucleus and it has linear chromosomes. Humans have 23 chromosomes and then they have two of each, so they have 46. But they have two pairs of chromosome number one. They have two, sorry, two of chromosome number one, two of chromosome number two. And so they have two complete copies of the genome and they have two complete copies of every chrom uh, chromosome and so therefore we are diploid. Prokaryotes are smaller. They, they are in the scale of about one micron. They don't have a nucleus. They have a single circular chromosome and they are haploid. So humans are multicellular eukaryotes. Right? And so organisms can either be single-celled or multicellular. So single-celled uh, bacteria, for example, tend to be just, they just exist as an individual cell. They're not connected to, they're not considered to be part of a larger organism. Uh, humans are multicellular eukaryotes. Uh, we are made of billions of cells. And in addition to that, the cells are differentiated, meaning that they have different specialties. So a heart looks different than a brain, a uh, heart cell looks different than a brain cell, a brain cell looks different than a kidney cell. They are specialized or differentiated because they do different jobs. Whereas bacterial cells are all the same and protists and fungi, the cells are usually all the same. All right, so let's just briefly introduce ourselves to some of the other types of organisms in the world. So bacteria are small single-celled prokaryotes. Example, Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is a bacteria that you find on human skin. Uh, it's harmless if it remains on human skin. If you cut yourself and it gets underneath the skin, it will cause a, it will cause a reaction. It will cause an infection. Uh, so, so an example of a bacteria would be Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, there's other types of organisms on Earth that we refer to as yeasts. A yeast is a small single-celled eukaryote uh, uh, that grows as a mold or a fung uh, like a, similar to a fungus. Example, a nice example of a yeast that is relevant to humans is called Candida albicans. Candida albicans is also present on the surface of the skin. So we have millions of Candida albican cells on the outside of our skin per square centimeter. And it's normally on the outside of the skin, but again, if you cut yourself and it gets inside the skin, it will cause an infection. So Staphylococcus aureus and Candida albicans are both referred to as, they're both called, they're both something called opportunistic pathogens. Pathogens are microbes that make us sick, microorganisms that make us sick. These are very small, bacteria and yeast are very small cells. And you need a microscope to see them. You don't really notice that they're there. And they are generally harm harmless unless they end up, somehow end up someplace where they're not supposed to be. So as I said, if you cut your skin, they are normally found outside the skin, but if they can get under your skin, they'll cause a problem. And so that's something, when something does that, we refer to it as an opportunistic pathogen. All right, fungi are the true molds, molds. You know, you know, you leave a piece of bread around too long, you see this blue mold growing on it. Um, so fungi is a, uh, fungi are basically multicellular yeasts. So yeasts are, if you think about yeasts, they are individual fungal cells, whereas a fungus, fungi are multicellular yeasts. An example of a fungus that's relevant to humans is called Aspergillus flavus. Aspergillus flavus grows on vegetables and on grains and things like that. It will, it will cause spoilage of corn or spoilage of peanuts, for instance. And it's, it's significant to humans because it actually causes liver cancer if you eat it. So it is always a bad policy to, to eat moldy food. So if you have a piece of bread that has mold on it, you can't cut the piece of bread in half and then throw away the moldy part because parts of the moldy parts of the mold have extended underneath the surface and so the the fungus is distributed all the way through the bread and if you eat it you might cause yourself to have lung or, or uh, liver cancer because many of the 
fungi will do that. They will cause liver cancer if you eat them. All right. A protozoa or a protist is a large single-celled eukaryote. Uh, an example that's relevant to humans is something called Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia is a uh, is a is a uh, an interesting protist that lives in water. Uh, it, it it usually gets into water because the water is contaminated by animal droppings, uh, and that's an example of a protozoa. And then animals and plants are large multicellular eukaryotes. Humans are an example of a large multicellular eukaryote, and the genus and species name for humans, by the way, of course, is Homo, Homo sapiens. Okay, so you've seen how small bacteria are. Uh, these, the large round cells in this picture are yeast, and then the small rods, the small bacilli, are bacteria. This is Aspergillus flavus growing on an ear of corn. If you eat that, you will get lung, uh, uh, liver cancer. Right, so it's very bad for you. Uh, in general, molds are not good to eat. There are a few exceptions because mushrooms are considered to be fungi. Uh, and you can eat a mushroom without causing any harm, but many mushrooms you should never eat because they are poisonous. All right, so mushrooms are also an example of fungi. Okay, protozoa, Giardia lamblia. Uh, this is an example of a protist which lives in the water. Uh, these are primitive organisms that have been around for a, a few billion years, a couple of billion years before humans evolved. And uh, they're kind of interesting. They have two nuclei, but this is not normal, or this, it's, that's kind of a rare feature for a protist. Okay, so plants and, and animals are multicellular eukaryotes. This is a microscopic picture of human skin. Notice that all of these cells, these little triangular shaped things are human skin, the outer layer of human skin, and they notice that they're tightly held together and there are billions and billions of them. All right, so those are some different organisms that are composed of different types of cells than a human, but humans are multicellular eukaryotes. All right, let's now look at the characteristics of each of the individual cells that makes up a person. Okay, so as I said, the plasma membrane is the outer boundary of the cell. The nucleus is where the genes are contained. Ribosomes are very small organelles where proteins are built. Proteins are synthesized. The technical term for building a protein is called translation. So proteins are translated on ribosomes. Right. Also, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum is located just outside the nucleus. This is a network of membranes where proteins that are intended to be exported out of the cell are translated. Uh, there's a slight difference between what we call the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is associated with a lot of ribosomes, so we have ribosomes stuck to the outer surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, whereas the smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is where lipids are built. Right? So the rough endoplasmic reticulum is where proteins that are meant to be exported out of the cell are built, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is where lipids are, are synthesized. Okay, the Golgi complex is another network of membranes where proteins are glycosylated. The word glycosylation means when you stick, when you attach carbohydrates to proteins. So there are some proteins that in order to do their job, they have to have certain sugars attached to them as well, and you attach these sugars in the Golgi complex. Okay, next, mitochondria, singular mitochondrion. These are basically the energy factories of the cell. Uh, glucose is taken into cells and then put into the mitochondria. The mitochondria then break down the glucose in a series of discrete steps and then use the energy that's released to create a smaller energy molecule that is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And so uh, uh, they're kind of, in a way, they're kind of like a bank as well. If you consider energy to be like money, uh, if you have a $1,000 bill, you have a lot of money, but you can't really spend it anywhere because nobody can make change for that. Uh, you can't go and buy a chocolate bar with a $1,000 bill because the, the cashier doesn't have any change for that. So you go to the bank and you say, change this $1,000 bill for a whole bunch of $10 bills, and the bank can do that. So that's essentially what the what the, what the uh, mitochondria do. They convert glucose into ATP, 
a single glucose molecule contains a lot of energy, too much to be of any practical use to the cell. So the glucose is broken down in the mitochondria to form, and the energy that's released is used to, to, to build ATP, which is a more fungible energy, uh, quantity of energy. Fungible means easily converted from one form into another. Okay, the cytoskeleton. The, believe it or not, cells have a skeleton on the inside, and the cytoskeleton is a network of, of little protein filaments, little protein strands that run back and forth about inside the cell and hold the cell into a particular shape. The cytoskeletal filaments also move things around inside the cell. So things that are moving around in the cell are not simply just floating around at random. They are actually being moved from place to place by cytoskeletal filaments. And then finally, the area outside of the cell we refer to as the extracellular matrix, particularly if there are a bunch of proteins and carbohydrates located out the, outside of the cell. And if the cell is anchored into this this kind of a semi-solid matrix of proteins and carbohydrates, we refer to that as the extracellular matrix. So all of these terms are located down the side here, so you can refer to the words when I switch the slide. Okay, so here's a diagram of our cell, right? So that is a mitochondria. These green things here are meant to represent cytoskeletal filaments that hold the cell into shape and also move things around. This obviously is the nucleus, right? Here's another mitochondria and another one. On average, cells have about half a dozen mitochondria per cell. So here's the rough endoplasmic reticulum, right? This is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and this is the Golgi complex. And the whole thing is held together by the plasma membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, which we call the plasma membrane. All right, so as we said, the plasma membrane is the boundary of the cell and it's made of a phospholipid bilayer, two layers of phospholipids. Okay, so phospholipids tend to be very flexible and fluid-like, and so we reinforce and strengthen the plasma membrane by adding cholesterol to it. We discussed that in the last lecture. Now, there are a bunch of holes in the, in the plasma membrane that allow things to go in or out. We refer to these as membrane channels membrane channels. Uh, they are basically holes or tubes that let things in or out and they can be opened or closed depending on whether the cell wants them to be open or closed. And they move things in and out of the cell through either what's known as active transport or passive transport. Okay, passive transport means that if you, if you leave the hole closed and you open it, things will move in and out of the cell according to the concentration gradient or along the concentration gradient. What do I mean by concentration gradient? I'm talking about diffusion. So if something is concentrated on the outside of the membrane and is, is less concentrated inside the membrane, which direction will it move? Things will diffuse into the cell inside the membrane until the concentration is equal on both sides of the membrane. That would be traveling, traveling either in or out of the cell depending on the concentration gradient. So for example, if you have a high concentration of sodium outside of the cell and a low concentration of sodium inside the cell, you open up one of these channels and the sodium will go into the cell until, until you have an equal concentration of sodium on both sides. That's referred to as passive transport because the molecules are moving simply according to concentration. They're diffusing and moving from an area where they are more concentrated to an area where they're less concentrated. So that would be passive transport. However, the cell is capable of actually physically pumping things in or out of cells against the concentration gradient. For example, you can do active transport if you have a high concentration of sodium outside the cell and a low concentration of sodium inside the cell, the cell can actually use energy to pump sodium outside the cell where it's already really concentrated, where it's already very concentrated. Obviously that takes energy. It takes energy to move something from an area where it's, uh, where it takes energy to move more things into an already crowded space. So you've probably seen, you may know that in Japan, for instance, the subways are very crowded and they have ushers that when the subway is about to leave, the purpose of these ushers is to jam and push more people into the subway. Well, active transport is sort of like that. It takes energy to push 
molecules into an area where they are already concentrated. Their, their natural tendency is to go the other way. So a cell typically expends, expends a lot of energy to push things out using active transport, and the energy source that they use is ATP. Okay, now on the surface of the cell, we have things called receptors, cell surface receptors that receive signals from uh, other cells and other parts of the body. Those signals are usually cytokines, which are small proteins, or growth factors, which are small proteins as well, or hormones, which are actually lipids. All right, now the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, is said to be selectively permeable, which means that water can go in and out freely, but other things can't. Okay, now that's interesting because let's say that you have a cell and the cell has a low concentration of sodium inside the cell and a high concentration of sodium outside the cell. We haven't opened any of the channels. The sodium is not free to move in or out of the cell, but the water is. So you'll have kind of a funny version of diffusion, which is called osmosis. And osmosis, what osmosis is, is that the water will move to an area where the water is less concentrated, if I can put it that way. So, so if you have a high concentration of sodium outside the cell, that's the same thing as saying that you have a low concentration of water outside the cell. So the water will move from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell in an attempt to equalize the concentration of water on both sides of the membrane, which would be the same as, as equalizing the concentration of sodium on both sides of the membrane. So typically, if you put a cell into a very salty solution, it will shrink because water will, dif will diffuse out of the cell by osmosis. If you put a cell into a, a, a solution of a salt solution where the salt concentration is lower outside the cell than it is inside, then water will diffuse into the cell and it will swell up or perhaps even burst. And that in, in that happens in many tissues in the human body when you have swelling. What's actually happening is that water is diffusing into the cells and causing the cells and the tissue that those cells make up to swell. And uh, that's called, the technical term for that in medicine and physiology is called edema, E-D-E-M-A, edema. All right, now, the area inside the cell is referred to as the cytoplasm, by the way. Okay, so here's a diagram of the phospholipid bilayer showing you the phospholipids. It's also showing you the cholesterol here. And it's also showing you membrane channels and membrane receptors located on the surface of the cell. Okay, so here we have one cell sending a signal to another cell. The cell is a cytokine or a growth factor or in some cases a hormone and that, that uh, signal is received by something called a cell surface receptor on the other cell. That cell surface receptor will then transmit the signal that it received to the nucleus and turn on some genes or turn on off some genes, depending on what the cell has been told to do. Okay, so as I said, the membrane is selectively permeable. Water is free to cross in and out of a cell, but other things are not. Okay, so osmosis is a term that we use to describe water going in or out of a cell based on how concentrated the salts are either inside or outside of the cell. And the, whether water will go in or out will depend on the tonicity of the solution outside the cell. Right, so tonicity means how concentrated is the solution. Uh, in an earlier lecture, the chemistry lecture, we, we learned about the concentration of solutions. Right? So suppose that you have a cell that has 100 millimolar sodium chloride inside the cell, and then it has 500 millimolar sodium chloride outside the cell. We say that the solution outside the cell is, we say that the cell is in a hypertonic solution. The cell is in a hypertonic solution because the solution, of the, the, the solution is more concentrated outside the cell than it is inside the cell. Okay, so if you put a cell into a hypertonic solution, water will go out of the cell and it will shrink. On the other hand, if you put a cell into a hypotonic solution, water will go into the cell and it will swell up. It may even burst if the difference in concentration is great enough. And then finally, if you put a cell into a solution that has equal concentrations of whatever solution you're talking about, both inside and outside the cell, that is referred to as an isotonic solution. So the word iso means the same. Isotonic solution, water will neither go in or out of the cell 
uh, it, in fact, it goes in and out of the cell at the same rate, but the cell neither shrinks nor swells, it remains the same size because it doesn't actually gain or lose a net amount of water. Okay, so as I said, in human physiology, we care about this because if you have cells, if, if for whatever reason the, the, the saltiness or the concentration of solutes in the blood drops, that will cause that will cause water to seep into the cells and the cells adjacent cells and cells will swell up and we call swelling edema technically swelling is called edema if you put human cells into a hypertonic solution the swelling will go down because the water will go out and the cells will shrink right so swelling is caused by swelling or edema is generally caused by varying the salt concentration in the blood uh, and it's actually not salt that we're it's not salt like sodium chloride that we're varying it's actually proteins uh, dissolved globular pro, dissolved globular proteins in the blood have a, have an influence on the tonicity of the blood so uh, if if you have a lot of dissolved proteins in the blood then the blood will be hypertonic relative to the cells and if you have few only a few dissolved proteins in the blood then the the blood will be hypotonic relative to the cells so here's an example of edema this is technically called pitting edema this is where you push your finger against the swollen tissue and then when you take your your finger away it leaves a pit right so we call that pitting edema or just plain edema just call it plain edema okay this is an example of anaphylaxis anaphylaxis we'll be talking about several times in this course anaphylaxis is where uh, the 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 soft tissues of the body swell up because water has diffused out of the blood into the soft tissues. Soft tissues include adipose tissue, which we'll talk about later. Uh, so if, and this can be triggered sometimes by an allergic, an allergic reaction to something. So you may, you may know somebody who has a peanut al allergy or an, al an allergy to bee stings or to wasp venom. Uh, and if they eat a peanut, then this will happen to them. They will, their, their eyes will swell up, uh, their, thro their throat will swell up, they may have difficulty breathing. And that's called anaphylaxis. And it's, it's a general, uh, it's a sudden extreme drop in blood pressure that is caused by the fluid, the water leaking out of the blood into the cells. And this causes a, a, a reduction in the blood volume. And the reduction in the blood volume causes a drop, a rapid drop in blood pressure, which can be very dangerous. Okay, so this is anaphylaxis. We're going to talk about anaphylaxis quite a few times in this course. Okay, now bringing things into the cell. Cells can actually basically wrap their arms around things and bring them inside, and that is referred to as endocytosis. Remember the word cyto refers to cell. Endo refers to in, going inside. So endocytosis is the process of bringing things inside the cell. There are three general types of bringing things inside the cell. I just mentioned the fact that some cells have, in fact, all cells have different types of receptors on their surface, and those receptors are stimulated by signals, and those signals are, the, are signals that are actually made out of protein. So cell surface receptors don't receive signals like television signals or radio signals. They receive protein signals where another cell or cells will send out a protein that attaches to a surface on the, uh, a receptor on the surface of the cell. And then what happens when those proteins, those cytokines or growth factors attach to the cell receptor is that all of the receptors that have been touched by these, by these cytokines will cluster together they will form a group and then they will go inside the cell. And that is referred to as receptor mediated endocytosis or RME. So RME is where you take, you attach things to receptors on the surface of the cell, they cluster together into a cluster and then they're taken inside. So that bringing things inside the cell is called endocytosis. And then if, it is, if that process is mediated by receptors, we call it receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now sometimes things that are pretending to be cytokines can use this, can exploit this property to, to sneak into a cell when they're not meant to get into a cell. A perfect example of that is the human immunodeficiency virus, the AIDS virus. The AIDS virus pretends to be a cytokine. It has proteins on its surface. The virus has proteins on its surface that look very much like 
the cytokine that's supposed to attach to a cell surface receptor called CD4. And so the cell, these viruses attach to the outer surface of the cell, the, the, the CD4 receptors cluster together and then bring it inside. So the HIV virus, the AIDS virus, gets into, gets into human cells using receptor-mediated endocytosis. It's kind of like a letter bomb, you know, if you have a terrorist who's sending bombs to people through the mail, you, take, you receive this parcel, you take it inside, and when you open it, it, ex it explodes. That's basically how the HIV virus gets inside, it, through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Okay, cells can also drag in large particles of food. That's called phagocytosis. So the word phago is an ancient Greek word meaning to eat. Right? So phagocytosis is cell eating. Cell drinking is called pinocytosis. Okay, so here we have an example of receptor-mediated endocytosis. On the, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you can see a, a microscope image of a bunch of cytokines attaching to cell surface receptors here. And then they cluster together and they form a, what's known as a vesicle. So here we have these red triangles are meant to be cell surface receptors and the, perp uh, sorry, the, the red Y-shaped things are meant to be receptors and the purple triangles are meant to be a cytokine. And the general term for things that attach themselves to receptors is the word ligand or ligand. Right? So the word lig ligate means to join together. And so a ligand means something that you join to something else. Okay, but in this case, the ligands happen to be cytokines. Okay, so the <clears throat> cytokines attach to the cell surface receptors they all cluster together like this, and then they are brought inside the cell in a, in a vesicle or a container. Right? So here's the word vesicle down here if you don't know how to spell it. Right? So a vesicle is a small container that's inside the cell. All right, here's the HIV virus sneaking into, the, into a human cell like a, like a letter bomb. It has cytokines on its own surface. Those cytokines attach to the CD4 receptor on the surface and it gets inside. Here is phagocytosis. So the cell kind of reaches out and grabs a piece of food and brings it back in and eats it. That type of operation is generally carried out by a type of cell called a phagocyte. So there are several important cells that are classified as phagocytes and we'll talk about them later. Most of them are uh, part of the immune system. So the immune system contains white blood cells called phagocytes whose job it is to eat and therefore destroy bacteria that are invading the human body. Okay, so here we have an example of pinocytosis. So we have this little, the plasma membrane kind of pinches inwards and then grabs a whole bunch of liquid and drags it into the cell as a vesicle. And then here is receptor mediated endocytosis again. This is a macrophage. This is one of the phagocytes that I just told you about. It's a cell that's part of the immune system. And you can see that it's literally reaching out and grabbing bacteria. The green things are bacteria. And it takes them back like kind of like the arms of an octopus. It reaches out and grabs bacteria and drags them back and puts them onto the surface of, of itself. And then the surface, the plasma membrane, envelops them. The plasma membrane drags them inside through phagocytosis. Okay, so the, so the cell plasma membrane, to summarize, it's made of a phospholipid bilayer. It's selectively permeable to water, which has consequences, which cause swelling or shrinking, depending on how tonic the blood is. And things can be brought into the cell through endocytosis. There are three basic types of endocytosis. They are called phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Okay, and things can also be sent out of the cell using vesicles, and when we do that, we refer to that as exocytosis. So the word exo, of course, means to send out or to leave, and the word endo means to go inside or to, to come inside. Okay, the nucleus has its own plasma membrane, which we call the nuclear membrane. It has the genes on the chromosomes. Uh, if you want to make a copy of the gene, you make a copy of the gene in RNA instead of DNA, and we call that a messenger RNA. The messenger RNA goes out to the cytoplasm, the area outside the nucleus but inside the plasma membrane, where it is translated by ribosomes. 
Right. Now, some of those ribosomes are located on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and proteins that are that are translated on the ribosomes that are stuck to the rough endoplasmic reticulum are meant to go outside. So the, the protein is actually translated and then it threads into the inside as it's being translated, it threads its way inside the endoplasmic reticulum. And then from the endoplasmic reticulum, it is they are sent in a vesicle to the Golgi complex where they're glycosylated. And then they're sent from the Golgi complex in a vesicle to outside. And so the cell dumps them outside once those proteins have been glycosylated. Okay, so there is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It appears to be rough. It's got these little bumps on it because those are actually ribosomes. Right, and there's the nucleus with the DNA inside. Okay, so here we have chromosomes. They are made of a DNA double helix that is wound up and compressed into a rod shape, which is only visible when the cell is dividing. This is an electron microscope image. This is a microscopic image of the human X chromosome on the left and the human Y chromosome on the right. So these two chromosomes came from a male, from a man. Uh, notice that the Y chromosome is actually much smaller than the X chromosome. Okay, so these chromosomes are only visible when the cell is dividing. These are plant cells, by the way. So the, one of the easiest ways to tell the difference between plant cells and animal cells is that plant cells are polyhedral. So in this case, they're square. So polyhedral just means they have, they have a kind of a rigid uh, cell wall that's held, that has corners to it, it has corners. So it might be a cube shape in this case. This is the, these cells are present in, the, in an onion root. This is the root of an onion. And this, the cells are cube shaped basically. But there are other plant cells that are octahedral shaped or, or various other polyhedral shapes. Okay, now we're looking at, this, at the cells in this onion and some of the cells are dividing. And the cell, in the cells that are dividing, you can actually see the chromosomes whereas you can't see the chromosomes in the cells that are not dividing because the chromosomes basically unwind. They decompress and unwind in between cell divisions so that the individual chromosomes are not, are not visible, right? And the, the analogy that I like to use for that is it's like saying when the cell is dividing, it's like you're moving into another house. And so you have to pack everything into boxes. Okay, can you, can you, you, you pack all of your books into boxes in preparation for the move? Can you read those books when they're in boxes? No, you can't. You have to wait until you get to the new house and then you open up the boxes and you take all the, take all the books out and then you can read them. Well, if you think of the chromosomes as being like library books because they contain instructions on how to build proteins, the cell that's dividing has already packed up all of its books into boxes and they can't be used until you take them until the cell is finished dividing and you take them back out of the boxes. Right? So that's my analogy. Uh, chromosomes are only visible when the cell is dividing. That's like moving house and packing all your books into boxes. This is another microscope image showing an, what's known as an interphase nucleus. So this is a nucleus that is not in the process of dividing. Right? And so the, the chromosomes are decompressed and you can't see, you can no longer see individual chromosomes. And outside the nucleus, we have a lot of this rough endoplasmic reticulum. You see, it looks kind of like it, it would be rough if you rubbed your hand across it. That's because of the ribosomes that are located on the outside of the rough ER. Okay, now on the subject of ribosomes, they are very small organelles that are about five to seven nanometers in size. And they are where protein is trans proteins are translated. So messenger RNAs are copied or transcribed in the nucleus. They come outside, they load onto a ribosome, and then the ribosome puts together the amino acid sequence that the messenger RNA has specified. All right now, if the protein is meant to be used inside the cell, then we use ribosomes that are just located in the cytoplasm. If the protein is meant to be exported out of the cell, then we synthesize or translate these proteins on the ribosomes that are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, here's a ribosome. It has two subunits, a large one and a small one. 
right? And the messenger RNA attaches itself to a ribosome and then the ribosome reads it. And then according to the genetic code that we discussed earlier, it puts together one amino acid after another after another into the, into the correct sequence to make the protein that the messenger RNA told it to build. All right, so the endoplasmic reticulum, endo of course means inside, and then plasmic, endoplasmic refers to being located inside the cytoplasm. Uh, the word reticulum refers to a network of membranes. So re reticula refers to membranes. Okay, so there's, there is a network of membranes inside the cell called the endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on the outside and it is meant to create proteins that are meant to be exported out of the cell. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum has no ribosomes and lipids are built there. Okay, so why do you, why do you think you need to build lipids? Well, what if the cell just grows? Right? So if the cell expands, it needs to have more plasma membrane, doesn't it? If it's bigger, if it grows bigger, it needs to have more plasma membrane. So that, that's, that takes place in the smooth ER. All right, so back to our diagram again. All right, so the rough endoplasmic reticulum is there, right? And then proteins are synthesized there, and then they're sent by vesicles to the Golgi complex, where they are glycosylated. And then from the Golgi complex, they're packaged into vesicles and then sent outside the cell. Okay, so there's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's closely associated with the nucleus. Here's another diagram of the rough endoplasmic reticulum here. This is the inside of the nucleus, right? And this is an electron microscope image of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. These little dark spots on the outside of the membrane are ribosomes. In this diagram, the ribosomes are illustrated as little red dots. Okay, so here's the endoplasmic reticulum yet again. Now on to the subject of the Golgi complex. Okay, so it is a network of membranes that's located between the endoplasmic reticulum and the plasma membrane. So proteins arrive in the in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and they're translated they are translated in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then they are trans they are transferred over to the Golgi complex where they become where they are glycosylated. So glycosylation means to put sugars onto a protein. And when you put a sugar onto a protein, you rename it a glycoprotein, a glycoprotein. So a protein is just made of amino acids, whereas a glycoprotein is a protein that has had carbohydrates attached to it in the Golgi complex. Right. Now, uh, these proteins are sent out into the environment, in, into the blood, for instance, and they will wander around and they'll float around in the blood and they'll, they will make contact with other cells intermittently. And those cells will decide to take the, those proteins inside phagocytosis. They will decide whether or not to take those proteins inside based on what carbohydrate motifs they had. So the carbohydrate motifs uh, are, act sort of like an address on a parcel, which says, okay, it's okay for me to take this. It bumps into a cell and the cell says, am I supposed to get this? No, this has the wrong address on it. Let it go and let it go to another cell and then another protein parcel bumps into the cell and it says, oh, this has got the right carbohydrate address. I can bring it inside. So here we have the nucleus and then, then we have the endoplasmic reticulum and then here we have the outside of the cell and here we have the Golgi complex. So proteins that are meant to be exported outside the cell are synthesized inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Then they are packaged into vesicles and those vesicles are moved by cytoskeletal filaments from the rough ER to the Golgi complex. And then they transit through the Golgi complex. They move through the Golgi complex and they get glycosylated as they move through the Golgi complex. And then finally they get packaged into vesicles, which then fuse with the plasma membrane and dump the protein, the glycoproteins outside the cell. Here's an electron microscope image of a, of a Golgi complex. All right, so we said that mitochondria are the energy factories of the cell. They break down glucose in a series of small steps called aerobic respiration, and they convert the energy that's liberated into a smaller energy unit called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Uh, 
And as I said, glucose is sort of like having a $1,000 bill. If you can't go to the bank and change it, you can't really use the $1,000 bill, even though it's a lot of money. So you go to the bank and you have the bank change the $1,000 bills into $5 bills, which is what adenosine triphosphate is. All right, so here's a mitochondria. The mitochondria, you can see how big it is relative to the cell. There's a mitochondria there. And this is an electron microscope image of a mitochondria. All right, the cytoskeletal filaments. So there's a network of threads or filaments that are made of protein that holds the cell into its proper shape and which moves things around inside the cell. And there are three types of microtubules, one, uh, sorry, three types of cytoskeletal filaments. There are three types of cytoskeletal filaments. Microtubules are the largest. They are approximately 25 nanometers in diameter. They are made of a protein called tubulin, right? And as I said, they are the largest. And they are usually responsible for moving vesicles around inside the cell and moving other things around inside the cell. Okay, then the smallest of the cytoskeletal filaments are called microfilaments, right? And they are made of a protein called actin, right? So you do need to memorize tubulin and you do need to memorize actin. Okay, so the actin microfilaments are the smallest. They are about 7 nanometers in diameter. So the microtubules are about 25 nanometers in diameter and they are also hollow on the inside like a tube and that's where they get their name. They are microtubes, small tubes or microtubules. Right? So uh, they are around 25 nanometers in diameter and hollow on the inside. Microfilaments are about seven nanometers in diameter and are solid. And then in between, we have intermediate filaments that are generally you know, 10 or 12 micro, uh, nanometers rather, nanometers in diameter. And they are made of various different, pro different proteins. One of the proteins that, that that intermediate filaments are made of is keratin, which is also what hair and fingernails are made of. And some of the other proteins are known as lamin B protein, lamin A protein. You'll learn all about those, those uh, proteins if you take biology 200. Okay, so here you can see this is a fluorescent microscope image, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, but you can see here that the microtubules are stained in green and the microfilaments are stained in red. So you can see that in, and the, the, nucleus, the nucleus is stained in blue. So you can see that the, the network of cytoskeletal filaments that you find inside a, inside a cell is quite extensive. It's very extensive. Okay, if we move outside the cell completely, if we, if we move outside the plasma membrane, we encounter the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix is a, is a semi-solid network of proteins and carbohydrates that you find outside the cell. Three of the most common proteins that you find in the extracellular matrix are called elastin, collagen, and fibronectin. You should memorize those three proteins as soon as you can because they do appear on tests, right? So, the, so elastin, collagen, and fibronectin are three structural proteins that are found in the extracellular matrix of the human body. When we start talking about different tissues, uh, connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue, and loose uh, areolar connective tissue are made primarily of elastin, collagen, and fibronectin. Okay, now cells are anchored into this matrix by proteins that are called integrants, right? So the cell is located in the extracellular matrix, but it's also held in place, strongly held in place by a class of proteins that are called integrants. Okay, so here's a diagram showing the plasma membrane, right? And then on the inside of the cell, we have the cytoskeletal filaments, including the microfilaments made of actin. Outside, we have fibronectin, collagen, and elastin all together, uh, together with a few carbohydrates that constitute the extracellular matrix. So this is the extracellular matrix outside the cell. And then here we have these transmembrane proteins. A transmembrane protein is a protein that goes all the way from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And these are integrants. And they are, you can see that the integrins are grabbing hold of the, of the micro, microfilaments on the inside, and they're grabbing hold of the collagen and the elastin and the fibronectin on the outside. 
So they're grabbing hold of the extracellular matrix on the outside while simultaneously holding on to something rigid and hard and solid on the inside, and that has the effect of firmly anchoring the, the cell inside the extracellular matrix. Okay, some cells move around and some cells move various things around. They stay in place, but they move other things around. So there are two ways that you can do that. One way you can do it is by covering the cell with something called cilia. Singular cilium is singular, cilia is plural. Cilia are small motorized finger-like structures that move things around or they can be used by the cell to swim. Uh, in the human body, there aren't any cells that use cilia to swim. Instead, they move things around. So two examples. Uh, in the trachea, the windpipe, the, tra the windpipe is lined with ciliated cells and their job is to, these motorized little fingers, their job is to move mucus. Mucus is the runny sticky stuff that comes out of your nose when you have a cold. Their job is to move mucus that is located in the windpipe in the trachea is to move that mucus up, up into the mouth so that you can cough it out and swallow it. So that's one place where you would find ciliated cells in the human body. The other place is you would find ciliated cells in the fallopian tubes, and their job is to trans is to move the eggs from the from the ovaries to the uterus. Right, so there are two places in the human body where you see cilia. Okay, there's one place in the body where you would find a flagellum. Flagellum is singular. Flagella is plural. Right, so there are lots of bacteria that have flagella, and a flagella is a large whip that is used to swim, basically. But so a bacteria, there are lots of bacteria that have flagella that kind of wave this whip around in the liquid that they're located in, and they use that to swim. Okay, so there are bacteria in the human body, but they're not meant to be there. Uh, but there are, there is one place in the human body where you would still find cells that are fl flagellated. That, that are meant to have a flagellum, and that, of course, is the sperm. Right? So a male sperm is able to swim all the way up the vagina and through the cervix, through the uterus, and then up into the fallopian tubes. It does all of that swimming because it has a, it has a whip attached to the end of it uh, called a flagellum, which it whips around. Okay, so here is a closer, lo a close-up microscopic look at the trachea. And the trachea is covered with ciliated, uh, ciliated cells that are there to move mucus upwards through the trachea. This is a diagram of what these cells look like. So you can see these, these things here are called ciliated columnar epithelium, uh, epithelial cells, and they have these cilia on the top that are, that are there to move the mucus upwards through the trachea. And of course, there's a, there's a flagellated sperm, so there's a flagella on the end of it, so that sperm is swimming on its way to fertilize an egg. Okay, and then here we have a number of sperms that have run into the egg, and usually they run into it in the fallopian tube of the, of the woman. And, and so these, these sperms, these spermatozoa, are desperately trying to penetrate the outer plasma membrane of the egg and get inside. As soon as one of them gets inside, it will cause a, a change in the structure of the plasma membrane so that none of the others can get inside. So that's a way of guaranteeing that only one sperm will fertilize one egg. Okay, so what are the sizes of cells once again? Animal cells typically are around 10 microns in diameter. Plant cells tend to be larger, 50 to 100. Bacteria tend to be quite small, 1 micron. Mitochondria, which are the energy-producing organelles in the cell, are also one micron in size, and the fact that they're the same size as a bacteria is not a coincidence. Uh, mitochondria used to be independently living bacteria. At some point during evolution, probably a billion years ago, a eukaryotic cell swallowed some bacteria, and instead of dissolving it and digesting it, it just kept it, and then we've kept them ever since. Um, and then a ribosome is about 5 nanometers in size, which is about 0 0.005 microns. Viruses tend to be very small, about, about 10 nanometers or so. Okay, so if we're looking at things with microscopes, then we have to take, the consider we have to take into consideration how big the things we're looking at are. So if things are quite large, anywhere down to half a micron or, or 50, 50 microns or so, up to a meter or two meters, like humans, 
right? We don't actually need a microscope to see. We can see them with the naked eye. If things are about 100 or 500 microns or smaller, we need to use something called a light microscope. That means we can see anything down to the size of a bacteria. We can certainly see a human cell or a plant cell using a light microscope. And if we want to see things that are much smaller than that, down to the nanometer scale, we use a special type of microscope called an electron microscope. So let's talk about microscopes. Light microscopes are also known as bright field microscopes. And there are two types of light microscopes, two types of bright field microscopes. One type is called, one type is called a compound microscope and the other type is called a dissecting microscope. With a compound microscope, you take whatever you're looking at and you slice it into thin slices, and then you put those thin slices onto a glass microscope slide, and then you put the slide on top of a light source, on top of a light bulb, and you look at it with a, with a lens that you've put above the slide. So you have a light bulb below the slide that's illuminating the slide, and you have a lens, a microscope lens, above the slide, which you're using to magnify the image. A dissecting microscope, you simply put the whatever it is you're looking at down, and you look at the surface. And literally, sometimes people will, you know, you take a dead bird or something, and you dissect it under the dissecting microscope, and then you see the surfaces of the dead bird as you're cutting the bird open and exposing new surfaces. Now, there's a variation of a light microscope, which is called a fluorescent microscope. Instead of using visible light, it uses ultraviolet light. And if you use ultraviolet light, uh, the human eye cannot see ultraviolet light. But if you stain whatever it is that you're looking at with a stain, a fluorescent stain or a fluorescent dye, the fluorescent dye will absorb the ultraviolet light and then re-emit it at a longer wavelength, which we can see. Okay. Now, with a bright field microscope, with a light microscope, the resolution limit is about 0.1 or 0.5 microns. Resolution limit means what is the smallest detail that you can see. Right, so the smallest details that you can see with a light microscope are about 0.5 or 0.1 micrometers. So here we have two microscopes. This is a compound microscope. Here's the light source down here. Here are the objective lenses. And these things up here are called ocular lenses. The word ocular means eye. So you put your eyes up here, you put the slide in here, in between the objective lenses and the light source, and then you're looking through the slide. You're looking through the specimen. With a dissecting microscope, you simply put it down, you put the specimen down here, and you start cutting into it, and you look at it from above, and generally the light does not pass through the specimen that you're looking at. This is a fluorescent microscope uh, image. So this cell, this is a cell that has been stained with a fluorescent dye. And the, the fluorescent dye absorbs ultraviolet light and then re-emits it at a longer wavelength that we can perceive as colors. Okay. Electron microscopes are quite expensive and quite big. Uh, they are, there are two types of electron microscopes called a transmission electron microscope and a scanning electron microscope. With a transmission electron microscope, you cut things up into slices and you look through them. With a scanning electron microscope, you look at the surface. And so in that sense, a transmission microscope is sort of like a compound microscope, sort of like a compound light microscope. And a scanning electron microscope is sort of like a, dis a, a bright field dissecting microscope. Right. Now, the resolution limit for electron microscopes is much smaller than it is for bright field microscopes or light microscopes. It's about one nanometer. So it's about 500 times, uh, an electron microscope is about 500 or 1,000 times stronger in magnification than a light microscope. Right. So the maximum, maximum magnification that you can get from a light microscope is about 1,000 times magnification, 1,000 times. <laughs> Uh, the maximum magnification you can get from an electron microscope is around a million, around a million times, uh, down to the nanometer scale. Uh, so the, now, what a, electron microscopes, instead of using visible light to illuminate the specimen, they use a beam of electrons, and instead of using glass lenses, it uses copper magnets that that bend the electron beams to expand the the beams and spread them out so that you can enlarge the image. <laughs> 
So here's an electron microscope. You can see it's quite large. You can see the chair there where the technician sits, and you can see the ocular lenses here. This, this tube contains the beam of electrons as well as the copper magnets, and then the image that you get is projected onto the computer. It always gives you a black and white image, never a color image. But in some cases, you take the black and white images and you're allowed to color them in just to make it easier to see what you're looking at. Okay, so on the top here, we have an image that was taken by a transmission electron microscope. So this is a slice through a cell. And on the bottom, we have a flea, which is you know probably half a millimeter in size. And it is, uh, this image is taken by a scanning electron microscope. Okay, to summarize cell biology, we talked about the difference between prokaryote and eukaryotic cells. We talked about the difference between animal and plant cells. We talked about the difference between unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms. And multicellular organisms like humans tend to have differentiated cells where the cells are all different shapes and have different functions and they, they're using different subsets of the human genome. Uh, we had a brief discussion of microscopes and we had a brief discussion of the organelles that you find inside human cells. And that includes the plasma membrane that surrounds the cell on the outside. It includes the nucleus, which is where the genes are stored. It includes the smooth and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It includes the Golgi complex where proteins that are meant to be exported are glycosylated. It include, the discussion included the mitochondria, which are used to, to generate energy. Uh, basically converting glucose into ATP. We discussed ribosomes, which are very small organelles that are used to translate proteins, and we discussed the cytoskeletal filaments that hold the cell in shape and also move things around inside the cell, like vesicles, for instance. A vesicle is a small containers that you find inside the cell. Okay, so we talked about the plasma membrane being semi-permeable. We talked about the concept of osmosis. We talked about passive and active transport. We talked about endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. All right, so now you can proceed to unit four, which is on tissues and histology. This is getting, this is uh, unit four when we talk about histology will be the first official anatomy lecture and it will, it will be what's known as microscopic anatomy because we're looking at collections of cells that, that are carrying out a function, right? So uh, if you put together a whole bunch of cells that are all doing the same thing, we call that a tissue. And, and if you look at tissues as part of the study of anatomy, that's called microanatomy. If you're looking at whole organs, large organs, that's called gross anatomy, gross anatomy. Uh, so uh, I'll see you at the lecture for unit four. Thank you very much.